I'd like to welcome everybody uh, here today um, to uh, Pandemic and Practice, a webinar series for cardiovascular professionals and their teams. This is brought to you by uh, Gore, uh, the Medical Products Division. And I'd like to thank uh, Gore for sponsoring this uh, and for inviting uh, myself and, uh, and the panelists uh, here today. My name's uh, Darren Schneider, and I'll be your uh, moderator today. Gore is hosting a series of webinar sessions to cover various uh, aspects of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And today's session is focused on considerations for resuming elective cardiovascular procedures following uh, pandemic-related uh, uh, postponements that we've all been experiencing. And our guests, Today, we'll discuss the variables that they and their teams have been evaluating and dealing with when determining how and uh, when to uh, reopen their individual practices and start back up uh, with elective uh, procedures. We're gonna look at two persp perspectives today, uh, logistic considerations on the one hand, like staffing and setting up for social distancing and patient care considerations on the other, like managing patient expectations how to let them know that it's gonna be safe to return to have their conditions uh, treated. And when we look at these uh, uh, pers uh, perspectives, uh, please note that these are of course the, the perspectives and the opinions of uh, myself and the other uh, co-panelists and not the uh, opinions of Gore. Before we jump in and start, I wanted to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping here. Um, all participants are going to be uh, uh, muted for the duration of the symposium, but you can send us questions. You can utilize the question and answer tab at the bottom uh, of the uh, Zoom screen. You can write your question and we'll be looking at those questions and trying to address them uh, over the course of this, uh, of this webinar. With that in mind, uh, I'd like to get started. Uh, first thing I'll do is introduce myself and then the uh, panelists. Um, I'm a vascular surgeon uh, in New York City. Uh, I work at uh, Weill Cornell uh, Medical Center and uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital. And as all of you I'm sure are aware, reading in the, in the news, watching on the, on the news, kind of overnight, uh, things changed uh, dramatically for us. Our hospitals all became uh, virtually entirely COVID possible, positive hospitals uh, with huge censuses of uh, COVID positive patients. Uh, of course, we stopped all elective uh, procedures and really only were doing uh, truly emergent or uh, urgent uh, uh, procedures. And our hospital was kind of transformed to accommodate uh, and deal with the crisis. So most of our operating rooms were uh, converted into uh, COVID ICUs, uh, still today housing ventilated uh, COVID positive patients that also included our recovery rooms. A lot of our staff are, are no longer working with us. They've been redeployed to help cover ICUs and uh, emergency uh, departments. But, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to, to say that I think things are definitely getting better in New York. We've plateaued and hopefully we're on that downslope uh, of the curve. And so now we're actually having meetings of how to plan our recovery and be able to return to uh, treating uh, patients with vascular disease, including to resume doing some elective procedures. And that's the subject uh, of today's uh, uh, webinar. Of course, it's gonna be very different for many of you who didn't uh, experience uh, the pandemic locally to the extent that uh, we did in New York. So where everybody is along the curve and what their recovery is gonna look like uh, certainly is gonna be uh, different and is gonna depend on you know, where you work, hospital or OBL type setting, and also uh, the region and city uh, that you live in. And to that end, we've brought together a great panel that kind of represents some different areas and practices in the United States. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, uh, Ellen uh, Dillavu, uh, Gustavo Oderich, and, uh, and Arthur Qureshi, uh, who have all joined us today uh, to share their perspectives and, and hopefully uh, uh, help to answer uh, some of your questions. So why don't we start with you, Ellen? Why don't you go ahead and... Uh, introduce yourself and we'll get this rolling. 
Well, thanks very much, Darren. And I'd like to thank Gore for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Ellen Dillaboo. I'm a vascular surgeon at the Duke University Health System in Durham, North Carolina. And unlike the experience that Dr. Schneider had, we luckily did not have nearly the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in Durham. We modeled a lot of our preparations off what we saw working in New York and we're ready to do all the things that you have done, converting ORs to uh, ICUs and the like. But thankfully, we never really had to utilize those measures. Um, it feels like the peak has passed and that the peak was pretty low and gentle. And so we are now just starting to roll out plans to resume full operations within the next few weeks. Great. Why don't we move on to uh, Gustavo? Good evening, everybody. I would like to thank Darren and Gore for allowing me to be part of this great panel. I'm a vascular surgeon here in Rochester, Minnesota, and uh, similar to what Ellen said, we, we also have been blessed with uh, not such a high number of cases. Uh, having said that, it did have a tremendous impact in our practice, as it did everywhere else. and. Uh, it changed completely our dynamics. We are now very invested also into trying to return to a more elective practice. We have uh, certainly increased over the last couple of weeks our semi-urgent practice and learned a lot from the experiences in New York and other places. So I look forward to this panel today. Great, thanks Gustavo. How about you, Dr. Kreshi? Hi, um, good evening everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Gore, Dr. Schneider, and the other panelists for uh, this opportunity. Um, I am a pediatric and adult interventional cardiologist um, and uh, working here at uh, Texas Children's Hospital, but also um, in the adult uh, hospitals as well. Um, I think we are somewhere in between the curves that, have, kind of, that, uh, that uh, the other panelists are uh, uh, in. Dr. Schneider obviously has been really in the thick of it, but we've seen some, uh, a fair degree of uh, COVID here. We are um, now um, in the process of opening, opening up and uh, in sort of our ramp up phase, if you will. Great. Well, terrific. I think that that really kind of sets the stage for our uh, discussion today. And I thank you all again uh, for joining us. So let's start with the logistical and process side of things and talk about, you know, where your hospital's key considerations, uh, what they are when laying out your timeline uh, and phasing your return to elective procedures. I mean, for us, as we start discussing this, I mean, the questions are, number one, do we have the facilities? Uh, are our operating rooms not gonna be ICUs anymore and be places where we can work? Are we gonna have recovery rooms for the patients in COVID negative areas? Uh, from a personnel standpoint with the redeployed staff and physicians, or are they gonna come back so that we have appropriate personnel? And I think uh, also, you know, really importantly, do we have the protocols uh, to keep ourselves and our patients all safe and to be able to reassure them uh, as well? So that's kind of, we're in the discussion phase. We're not actually uh, uh, resuming anything uh, just yet. But why don't, why don't we go around again and, and see what everybody's thoughts are on that and where they are in that, uh, where you all are in that recovery process. Who wants to start, Gustavo? Oh, I can start, uh, Darren. Uh, I think we do share maybe a different perspective than, than you guys. So as I pointed out, uh, we have been blessed by a very flat curve and we've learned a lot from the statistics from other places on the behavior of this throughout the last two months. Uh, the feeling here is that uh, we are on the path to have things get better, although there is still a significant concern. We do have a lot of resources in terms uh, of the capacity of ventilators, in terms of PPE, and in terms of the, the, the availability of hospital beds in a way that, that we feel that there is a lot of complacence in the institution to accommodate for an increasing practice. At the same time, I think uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, we've seen that the work that was done with the semi-urgent 
procedures and, and increasing already the outpatient practice has shown that it has been safe with the measures that we instituted, such as, you know, using masks and, and, uh, and promoting the social distancing, that, uh, that we feel that, that it, is, it is safe to continue on that path. Now, we still have the direction to not do elective procedures at the present time. Uh, there is a lot of discussions going on at the government level. We just learned today, for example, that Wisconsin has allowed uh, now to do uh, elective surgery. So that's going to affect some of the Mayo health system, uh, but not here for us in Rochester. Um, I, I have... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I will stop talking and let you guys maybe tear up the discussion. Okay. How about you, Alan? Well, we made our entry back into um, doing a few more surgeries pretty gently. I think the Duke administration uh, did a great job of sort of watching the, the nationwide curves and getting us all ready. And we started doing a few more, you know, urgent, not emergent, but urgent-ish surgeries, probably about a week to two weeks ago, trying to avoid surgeries that would involve intubations, trying to avoid ICU stays, and if possible, you know, trying to do urgent things on an ambulatory basis. And then as we have come seemingly through the peak, now we are opening the ORs up to about half of our normal volume with every case still being uh, carefully considered and approved before it's uh, done in the OR. And part of this plan was that all of our patients have a COVID test within 72 hours. So we needed to have you know, the protocols for outpatient testing as well as inpatient work so that we could accommodate these patients and move things through smoothly. Okay. Uh, Arthur, how about you? Yes, so we, we are um, in the um, ramp up phase. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we stopped uh, doing elective procedures probably in the um, beginning to, uh, uh, in, in the beginning of, or middle of March. Um, and there were strict uh, orders from the governor. Um, and we were in a unique position because uh, being based in a pediatric hospital, we take care of adults with congenital heart disease, but we also wanted to um, be good partners for our adult hospitals here at the Texas Medical Center um, because they were seeing a fair number of patients at Methodist Hospital in St. Luke's and uh, um, uh, Herman Hospital as well, UT. In case there was a need for ventilators, we wanted to be able to provide that overflow. Um, so, um, uh, the governor has now uh, laxed those uh, orders as of uh, the end of last week where we can resume elective procedures, but there is um, a caveat to that, obviously, that is if hospitals are prepared uh, to, uh, and we can talk about this a little later, I think, but if they are well prepared uh, to provide safety to the patients, families, and uh, have enough PPE and supplies, so on. Um, so we started that process, but our ramping up phase has not been um, like turning a light switch on, like Dr. Fauci keeps saying, it hasn't been like that. Uh, we've uh, gradually gone up to um, about 50 to 75% right now, and we're still working on a team's model. So we're trying not to expose all uh, uh, cath attendings or nurses. Um, and so even though a majority of the cath labs are up and running, we're trying to, recognizing that that will put a, a little bit more load on uh, some physicians and nurses, we'll be in a rotating pool. Um, but by um, May 16th, we should be up to schedule uh, if the curve continues to go in the direction it is. Good. Well, I, I think to that end, and I, I'm going to come back to you in just a minute, because um, before we totally dive into patient expectations, I um, thought that we should talk about that approach to the team, team wellness, uh, dealing uh, with and preventing uh, burnout and, uh, and dealing with these physician schedules. And you talked about having the team approach or, or shift. And I know that you've done some work uh, and, and spoken and, and written on this before. So you were nice enough to share some slides. So this is kind of a plan. 
So why don't I put up your slides and have you just dive a little bit deeper into that uh, for us. So let me see if I can share my screen again to get your slides up and, uh, and have you, uh, Oh, that's the wrong slide. I'm sorry. There, I think that that's your first slide. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Schneider. So really, um, this was a multi-institutional study, and it was led by Brian Morey um, out of Seattle. And of course, they they were um, the first in the U.S. to really see this this pandemic. And uh, also Sharon Satanandam out of Tennessee. So lots of institutions actually um, contributed to this, and it was quite timely. Um, I think this, uh, these few bullet points will uh, demonstrate uh, where we were and what considerations we have going forward. Um, the first one is obviously a, a given we wanted to ensure appropriate and safe delivery of care for any patient, regardless of whether they had um, coronavirus or not during this pandemic. Um, we also wanted to take appropriate measures to protect staff and take all necessary steps to mitigate, mitigate the spread of the virus. And this involves some simulations also. We had a number of simulations um, in our institution where we would uh, simulate some, uh, some scenarios that would uh, highlight how we would um, take measures to appropriate our, our staff. Uh, we were also very mindful of institutional and CDC guidelines. I think as, as everybody's institution um, um, has been very involved, uh, we get nearly daily emails and daily updates. And I'm sure that's the same in your your institutions and um, as, as leaders of our respective groups, uh, we, we made sure we were updated on a daily basis um, because this was a very fluid situation and to some extent it still is a fluid situation. And, and those guidelines that were good for yesterday may not be good for uh, tomorrow. Um, now, the, the fourth point was a very uh, important uh, topic that we went through to determine which cases can be postponed. Um, so the uh, governor of Texas issued a, um, uh, a, um, a mandate that we stop uh, elective procedures uh, unless a procedure can, uh, cannot wait too long. Um, and so we sort of had that um, uh, time period as 30 days. Um, so we had to figure out which cases fall into that, that category. It's very easy to decide which cases are urgent um, the inpatients or the emergent cases, and then the elective cases are, uh, are, are, are easy to um, discern as well. But it's that really that middle group, the gray area group where they are semi-elective, where, you know, what is the ideal time? How long can you really wait while, while postponing? I know we'll talk about this later. Uh, so we did come up with some um, uh, guidelines based on lesions that were um, shared with our community in the SCAI. Um, and uh, agreed upon, again, just as guidelines that physicians can use because there was some um, angst in the, amongst the physicians as well in terms of which cases um, can go or should go and which, which should be postponed. And we also adopted a, um, a uh, policy in our institution where we would, if there was any doubt or any gray areas, we would have conferences, uh, conferences amongst the physicians just on the fly and say, hey, I have this patient, do you think this patient can wait 30 days or should we go now? Because uh, those are hard real life deci decisions that we have to make and often there's no right or wrong answer. And uh, I didn't show your second slide. I don't know if uh, you may have already covered all this, but. Yeah, okay. so I think that uh, the, 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 fir the first couple of bullet points just uh, uh, again highlights that we were very mindful of our adult hospital needs and the uh, potential of even turning a pediatric hospital into uh, an adult facility if there was a need for ventilators. Um, and then um, we obviously had uh, contingency plans if uh, physicians and other health healthcare workers were to contract the virus. Um, and, you know, I think that worked very well from our, our chief down to construct or to uh, formalize these teams um, because uh, it actually did uh, affect one of our teams where uh, an individual, uh, unfortunately, was uh, infected, and, and that led to exposure to multiple people. So having this contingency plan where we had rotating teams was helpful in that other teams could take over uh, quite quickly. Great. Thanks. Um, Ellen, uh, why don't you tell me from, you know, at Duke how things have been and, and with your colleagues in 
North Carolina. I mean, how have you reassured your team? How have you structured the team? Uh, are you using different teams and still having people working remotely? Uh, how are you going about uh, addressing whatever backlog of uh, cases you had as you try to re resort to business as usual, although I'm sure it's not business as usual just yet? No, it's not quite business as usual. And like Dr. Qureshi talked about, we also divided into sort of a platoon system where the residents and the APPs were separated and would stay home for up to four days at a time before the, the team would rotate. As attendings, we didn't do that quite as much. We tried to have sort of a, uh, a, a day on day off schedule where you know one of us would do all the hospital business one day and the other would stay home. But many times it, we, we all, you know, we are in the hospital more than any other team member but I think that that's appropriate. We also, at the beginning, before we knew the extent of the number of COVID positive patients we would be operating on, we agreed that attendings would do these, the COVID positive cases alone whenever possible. And if you needed an assistant, you would ask another attending to try to protect our trainees and our APPs, you know, both from a workforce standpoint but also just from a humanitarian standpoint. Um, and as we're ramping up, we're gradually adding people. We've had uh, some APPs and residents, resident team members working from home every day. And we're just gradually sort of adding to the number of people in-house every day to reflect the increased volume that we're slowly in, um, able to do. And uh, Gustavo, um, you know, how are you kind of triaging the backlog? Have you started looking at that, like what you're going to start to do first and, and how? So uh, as Ather pointed out, it's very fluid. And basically what we've been doing is following the recommendations of the institution, largely based on the CDC. So I would say for the first week or two of April, we were actually pretty much in the mode that uh, both the previous speakers alluded with like a platoon. Uh, fellows were designated a certain number of days, the rest remained at home. On a given date, we, uh, a given day we assigned attendees to also stay at home or to come to the hospital. And about two weeks ago, we really started to ramp up our outpatient clinic practice, but slowly, one of the issues is a lot of patients didn't want to actually come for the consults. And we did a lot of uh, televisits. Uh, and I would say that we went from 5 to 10% of our practice to where we are about now at a 30-40% of our full practice. We have kept a log of patients that have been postponed, a lot of cancellations. And uh, we are in the process of having them come back as an outpatient or have them been placed back on the operating list. But again, we are not allowed to do elective surgery. So the question then becomes what, what meets the criteria of what we call the semi-urgent surgery. That uh, criteria has been a little fluid as well. At first, we were extremely conservative, uh, basically looking at urgent indications. And I would say that that threshold has been lowered in part because there are patients that now have been waiting for, you know, they were already waiting for several months. Now with postponements, they're, they're waiting now for close to four or five months for their aneurysm or condition to be treated. So we have loosened a little bit this criteria. It has also been all, all done in a consensus with our group. And as Ellen pointed out, another uh, thing that I would want to tell is that every case that we are doing on semi-urgent is actually reviewed by the Department of Surgery by a committee, and, and there is, you know, an agreement that, that is a reasonable case. Now, uh, Darren, uh, our, our strategy is basically going to be to prioritize in terms of indication 
and also for how long the patient has been waiting for those that have been postponed. Um, but we are in the process of actually opening the gates, so to speak, it, at least for the outpatient practice. There is not a limitation on patients we can see on a face-to-face. -face. So we are in the process of expanding that practice significantly. One thing that has allowed that to happen is that uh, we have a lot more testing. So these patients are all patients that have been asymptomatic and are coming here for an outpatient visit to step the foot here at Mayo, they, they are being screened. Uh, two days before the visit, they have the PCR and they have the serology test. And then, of course, if there is no symptom and those tests are negative, then they are classified in the low risk category. They are allowed to come in for, for these outpatient visits. Our, uh, uh, we've got some questions here that I think are, are pertinent to kind of this issue. Um, are you finding that, that uh, even though you're starting to take patients, that, that maybe the patients don't feel safe or want to come in because of uh, risks and may actually, may inappropriately be putting their, their own lives at risk for that reason? Uh, Dr. Qureshi? Yes, I think that, that's an excellent question. Um, as, as this is now our second week in the ramp up phase, um, I think it has been, um, uh, we, find, we, have, we, we have found both scenarios. Um, we have found patients who've been waiting for a while and so um, uh, they, they are coming uh, into the hospital for these procedures, but we are definitely finding a fair number of patients who we have reached out to um, are hesitant uh, for good reason uh, to come back for procedures. Now, what we have done uh, or started to do is have the physicians uh, call the patients and families uh, themselves um, uh, as the first encounter. Uh, it certainly it, it adds a layer of complexity and time, but I think in, in this pandemic, we recognize that um, often uh, if an initial contact has been made by somebody else, the family will still want to speak to the physician of record um, and just uh, reassuring them that the reason why we've opened is our hospital um, is quite confident that uh, this is a safe place. We've taken the necessary precautions for uh, you and your, your uh, family members. Um, and often uh, what we are finding is that they are responsive to that and um, are um, coming in for procedures. But despite that, yes, uh, there have been a number of patients for good reason who would still like to postpone their procedure. Good, yeah. I think that uh, all of us are seeing similar things. and. And Ellen, we also got a question uh, about kind of that team and two attending approach to sparing trainees. But the question suggested that, well, maybe the faculty are more at risk for uh, acquiring a severe COVID infection because we're older and may have other medical issues. So, so what's kind of your, 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 your take on that? Well, I, I would hope that I'm not in that very high risk group, but who knows? I understand the point of the question, um, but we all felt that, you know, as as the you know the proverbial captains of the ship, that it was our duty to protect those underneath us and. You know, also keeping in mind that as attending surgeons, we have a lot more flexibility to be able to refuse to do a case or to postpone a case or something like that. Um, whereas a trainee might not, might not feel as comfortable recusing themselves. And so we, we just wanted to try to protect our team as well as we could. Good, and uh, you know, I know that we have, I mean, our approach had to be different and a lot of people were on the front lines, but our residents and fellows were on the front lines. We, we organized a, uh, a central line service in the Department of Surgery. And of course, as the vascular surgeon, since we weren't doing elective procedures, we didn't have much to do. And we have some expertise in obtaining vascular access that uh, that became our role to supervise this uh, line service. And you know, I could have sat in my office and had general surgery residents going around putting in lines and I just signed the notes, but that, that wouldn't be right either. So I think in the, in the 
you know, in the, in the same way, uh, we want the residents to be safe. We help them with every procedure. We go into the room, we put on the PPE. We, we don't expose them just to save ourselves. Uh, I think right. that would be wrong. We've all made a commitment uh, to our profession and to patients and to do what's needed. So I think that uh, everybody has stepped up and in a really remarkable way. I think that that's been an inspiring thing that, that we've seen how people have really stepped up to uh, address and, and to deal with whatever needs to get dealt with. Um, so one thing that I, I'm concerned about uh, is that, uh, especially in a place like New York where we've been hard hit, that patients are so afraid to come in that, and we postpone so many procedures and things that we know the vascular disease hasn't gone away, that maybe people are gonna present with much more advanced disease um, and that we're gonna get this surge of patients and, and not really even be able to deal with it uh, when we really do open up uh, back to business. Uh, um, Gustavo, any, any thoughts on that? I know, you know Mayo is a pretty high volume place. What's gonna happen when everybody has been postponed? It's okay and the gates are open and we gotta deal with it all. Darren, I think you're right on, the, on a very important topic that yes, uh, I do think that there is gonna be a surge of of pathology and when we look back, you know, maybe not too long from now, but we'll look back, we'll see uh, on national data that there has been some changes in presentation or mortality for certain diseases. Um, I think that uh, the behavior of this is gonna be different in different parts of the country. I mean, this is the thing about the United States. Uh, the, the density of population is so different uh, from different regions that uh, we are seeing examples that we're almost in different countries here. You know, what's going on in, in New York and what's going on in Minnesota is day and night. So I don't foresee that hopefully is going to be a, such an impact here because I do think that provided we don't have a second heat relatively soon, and the numbers start to go in the right direction. I do think that the elective practice is going to be resumed fairly soon. They'll be able to handle the populations. But I, I, I do fear that in regions that are more populated and hard hit by the virus, uh, even, even the, the, the improvement in this curve is going to take longer. The return to elective practice is going to take longer. And I do think that there is going to be the issue of patients being fearful of coming until it's the last minute, you know, until they have critical ischemia or they have, you know, a symptomatic aneurysm or a symptomatic carotid artery. So I think that we are going to see a bit of a change in the practice in that regard. And I think in, you know, hopefully in some of our upcoming webinars, maybe we'll get a little sample of that because some will include an international uh, panel. And so we'll see people who face those curves earlier on in time, you know, what they've seen in terms of surge of uh, patients presenting uh, after the fact. So that'll be interesting. We'll keep that in mind for, for future ones. Um, uh, Dr. Koreshi, we've got a question here. Um, uh, what are you doing in terms of testing surgeons and staff before elective cases? And is it just the, uh, the test for uh, you know, viral shedding or is there a role for uh, uh, antibody testing and serology, do you think, as well? Right. Uh, so uh, for patients or physicians and staff? Uh, I think that uh, physicians and staff. I mean, we've talked about how patients are pretty much across the board for elective procedures. We're going to test them ahead of time. But how are you dealing with your, with your staff as you reopen? What are the plans for that? Yes, I think that's an excellent question. I think if you ask uh, most staff, they want to have uh, testing, antibody testing. Um, uh, but you know, that's probably, you'll probably get that response from the general population as, as well. I think there's just a curiosity in terms of how, much, how many people, asymptomatic people have actually been exposed. Um, uh, we don't have any uh, formal testing for asymptomatic physicians or staff. Uh, when you enter the building, as I'm sure is the case in all of your hospitals, there's a number of questions that were, were asked, and that is really the screening process. Um, if you do have symptoms, I will say there's a low threshold for testing. We've been fortunate here that uh, 
test that we've not uh, had a shortage of, of tests, at least recently. And so a number of physicians and nurses, if they've been exposed uh, to a COVID positive patient or have symptoms that may uh, be consistent with uh, COVID-19, uh, testing is readily available. We actually have a drive-through uh, that's operated by our, our hospital. Um, but uh, routine screening or testing for all physicians has not been, uh, has not come up yet here. Yeah, we've, we've been addressing that. That's part of the plan. Um, I think because there's such a, uh, you know, high incidence of uh, cases and transmission in New York, I think that uh, in order to reopen for business and assure patients that they're going to want to come back, we've got to tell them that their physicians are not going to give them uh, an infection. So um, I think there is going to be uh, implemented, we're still in the discussion phases, but uh, regular testing of, uh, of staff will be implemented uh, for sure in our location. But again, it, it may depend on the need, the incidence, and the frequency, because that also uh, has a big impact, I think, on false negatives and false positives uh, as well. Um, um, I've got another question here, and I think that uh, uh, the audience is giving us some good questions here. Um, but a question that I think is also along the lines of this topic, um, most of us work in big academic centers, um, and we're the ones you know, dealing with a lot of the hospitalized and intubated uh, patients. But some people work at uh, smaller ambulatory centers, uh, OBLs, freestanding uh, uh, facilities where there are no, you know, hospitalized COVID population and, and, and there's a suggestion that maybe patients would want to go there rather than coming back to the, to the hospitals. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Ellen? Well, I, I think that's actually a great way to start. Um, and, you know, if we have seen that we have an OBL and we also service two more community community field hospitals as well as our main university hospital and the smaller hospitals I think have done an excellent job of really moving forward and ramping up quickly and although we've had a few people refuse by and large it seems as though most people who are offered procedures are ready to have them. Um, our OBL was cut down by the governor's order for a while, but now those restrictions are also lifting. And so we're trying to steer people toward there because it may be safer. So I, I think that's an excellent idea. And uh, uh, Dr. Koreshi, how about, you know, um, anything in Texas, I heard a lot about uh, legal uh, considerations with either postponement or resuming uh, practice. Um, has that been something that you've had to deal with? I'm sorry, could you repeat it again? I lost you for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. So, you know, I, I had heard that, that uh, there were some legal considerations, especially in, in Texas, that you guys were dealing with in terms of, uh, you know, first banning surgery, but also, um, you know, what are the risks that physicians uh, may be faced with um, from a legal perspective for postponing treatment of certain patients or how you decide to bring patients back in and, and that risk-benefit uh, equation. Right, I think that's an excellent question. Um, our uh, governor had uh, mandated uh, that we um, stop elective procedures, like I said in the beginning or uh, mid-March, um, and there were very strict uh, uh, fines actually um, tacked on to that. In fact, jail time and and uh, uh, monetary fines as well. Um, so it, it did lead to a lot of angst in the physician community, and uh, uh, that was actually the impetus, or one of the impetus, I should say, for us to come up with a document that um, provides risk stratification of, of, uh, of uh, d uh, lesions in our field. And I think there have been a number of documents out there in uh, adult cardiology, pediatric cardiology, but we wanted to put something out there just as a guide, recommendations for physicians who are dealing with this. Um, the way we have addressed it is always err on the side of, of, of do the best you know, we always want to do what's best for the patient. And so if it looks 50-50, do the procedure. Um, I think nobody will ever fault you for doing a procedure if you're, you know, sort of 50-50. You always want to do what's best. Uh, we always want to do what's best for the patient. I think that's the approach we've adopted. I think some physicians 
um, uh, had felt uncomfortable and we had recommended that we have uh, uh, group meetings or uh, go to a, um, uh, or, or discuss cases amongst physicians on the fly. You know, nowadays we've all gotten used to Zoom. So we would have these Zoom meetings and say, hey, I have this patient. Do you think it's safe to wait or not? So we had a lot of meetings like that and we would have a consensus and then document that. But it was very important. I will also say that the medical um, uh, journals have done a tremendous job about uh, putting out this information very rapidly. In fact, the article that we had submitted for, to be as a guideline, uh, sort of a guide for physicians in our field was accepted in less than 24 hours. And, and, and I think that they deserve a lot of credit for disseminating that information uh, that can be used by physicians and other healthcare providers. Terrific. Yeah, I think that, that that's spot on. You know, if you always make your decisions based on what you think is going to be right for the patient, then, you know, we're ultimately, I think, doing the right thing. So whenever in question, I, I think that that's some real uh, wisdom. Um, Gustavo, I know you've got a big referral practice where you have patients that come in from all over, and, and a lot of those patients have been postponed um, for their, their surgeries. And so, you know, how, how are you kind of dealing with those patients' expectations when you talk to them? And, and how have you implemented, you know, remote interactions with patients? You mentioned telehealth and telemedicine uh, earlier. What role is that playing for you now? So, uh, as the previous uh, panelists pointed out, the, the, the urgent cases are the easy ones because it's a no-brainer, you know, we just have to get them in. Uh, the, the more difficult part is to work through the process of those that can wait a certain period of time, how much time that is reasonable, how much time is just too long that it starts harming the patients. So one thing that has helped uh, a lot, uh, Darren, is that we are, we are testing a lot more the patients. We have that very well established. Uh, and we also have very well established the practice here at Mayo, the protocol of how to handle the patient, the family, protect the staff and protect the patient. Uh, so uh, right now, I, I would say the vast majority of the patients we are seeing are relatively regional. I would say within the four states next to Minnesota, I would say 90% of that is very infrequent. We are getting patients that are traveling from other states. Uh, and usually those uh, have uh, a more serious imminent problem. Uh, testing has been the key uh, for us. What we are doing is uh, 70, uh, 48 hours before doing the PCR and the serology if they are asymptomatic, and then admitting them if, if they have negative testing. All right, uh, uh, terrific. Um, you know, I, I think that the way we practice is gonna, at least for the foreseeable future, definitely be changed, maybe in a good way. And I do think that the implementation of telehealth and telemedicine is actually going to be beneficial. I'm hopeful, you know, CMS is paying for all telemedicine and telehealth where it was quite restricted in the past that, that, that they'll continue to, uh, to pay for those visits because I think we really found that they're, uh, they're valuable. And, you know, for example, you know, I might have five or six patients come in the office in an hour for me to see them on my clinic day, seeing 30 to 40 patients in a day. And, that's not going to happen anymore. We can't have all those patients in the in the waiting area and things like that. So, you know, we're being told that it might be two patients an hour, spaced apart, limiting people in in waiting rooms. So, how are we going to see the other patients? Well, I think we're going to continue to use telemedicine and telehealth at least for the foreseeable future for those patients. Uh, we can. How, how about you, uh, Ellen? How how what role is that playing in your practice? Well, we were able to ramp up our telehealth very quickly, and we are using that, of course, to supplement uh, for clinic visits, both for, for patients who are at a distance or who don't feel comfortable coming in. We're being asked to go through and sort out which visits can be safely done by telehealth. Um, I saw, and so I agree with everything you said, and I hope that that's part of our future. I saw one of the questions come in from the audience about supporting cases and what role is telehealth doing in that? 
And I think that that is a really interesting um, idea. You know, are we to a point where we can get one of our gore reps to come in and remotely support cases instead of having to be there in person? You know, I think we're all finding new ways to do things remotely. And I'm very hopeful that we continue to do that. Great. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, we've also seen that, um, some of you may be able to speak that in, in our clinical research as well. So the FDA has issued guidance saying that, that in-person follow-ups as part of clinical trials and that kind of thing. Uh, can now be done remotely um, whenever uh, appropriate and, you know, perhaps better for the patient and the practitioner. So, so I, I, I'm convinced that uh, some of these changes are going to be durable and actually be, uh, um, you know, a valuable and worthwhile change uh, to our practices. Um, why don't we in the last, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so maybe, you um, try to address some of these questions that have come in from the audience. There's a lot of them here. Uh, I'm starting to go through here. Um, there was one uh, that I saw. Does anybody have an affiliated VA practice? Somebody was asking specifically about that. Uh, that has affected, you know, routines and surveillance. I guess surveillance can apply to all of us. We all have patients that were following for routine surveillance of carotid disease, aortic aneurysms, uh, you know, graft surveillance, surveillance of dents, you know, cardiac surveillance, I'm sure for Dr. Uh, Qureshi as well. Um, how are you dealing with that? I mean, those things are routine surveillance, not uh, treatment uh, uh, of an acute problem. Um, Gustavo, what are your thoughts on that? So uh, I think that, Darren, this is one of the areas where telehealth is actually going to be very helpful is for surveillance, provided we can overcome the issue that it's very dependent on imaging and the quality of imaging. I do think that we still need to have a little bit of a better platform that will be easy for the patients and the physician to, to share the digital information to explain things for the patient. But I, I see that this is an area that I think is going to be picking up in all of our practices. I mean, there is not a lot of sense of, of having a patient travel all the way from home to have a picture and be told in 15 minutes that everything is just fine. And I you know it's nice to pre-select those that have issues to then come to the campus and have taken care of it. So I, I think that that is a, is a, is a major, major area of, uh, that's going to really come out of all this as maybe a positive thing and also being able to be reimbursed for that because all of us spend a lot of time already kind of doing this uh, free of charge, you know, looking at CTs, follow-up, follow-up, and, and communicating, spending time with the patient. So I think that that also is going to be uh, a, a positive factor. Dr. Qureshi, you have, uh, especially in the, the uh, um, cardiac practice that, that you're in, because we're in vascular practices, how is it different for you? Or the same. Yes, I think it's more uh, more or less the same, and I would agree with uh, yourself and uh, the other panelists. I think that th this is a silver lining. Um, uh, if uh, you know, out of all of this uh, uh, unfortunate scenario, I think this is uh, something that is going to uh, change the way we practice. And I say that, you know, I I, I consider myself not uh, very computer savvy, and we've all had to. You know, particularly, um, we're not of the younger generation who can do all of this at their fingertips. And we've all had to learn about Zoom and Cisco and uh, Skype and all that. And, um, but I do think that uh, most of us, uh, for, particularly for us proceduralists, most of our patients have seen uh, another physician before. So they've had an exam. Um, certainly, if they need an exam for our sicker patients, those patients, we want to see them. But to Dr. Odrich's point, to come in for a test and then to see us is just exposing them to other risks. And many patients come from far away. And I, I, I think that this is actually gonna change the way we practice medicine. And in many ways, it'll probably make us more efficient. Great. Um, anybody, here's another question that I think is kind of uh, interesting here that just came in. Um, any of us in terms of 
dealing with our cardiovascular patients and practices, are we at odds with our hospital administrators on anything in terms of their approach to, to recovery and re-implementing things? I mean, I know from, from my perspective that I think it's great that we're going to start to resume elective surgery, but I think elective outpatient surgery, at least in my view, doesn't address a lot of the life and limb threatening problems that vascular and cardiac patients have. I mean, those patients oftentimes need to come into the hospital and they do because it's a life and limb threatening procedure, but yet we can't do those. We, we should just be doing things that are truly outpatient. And some of those are important, the dialysis access procedures for life-saving dialysis and the like. If you can do a, uh, you know, a, a cardiac procedure as an outpatient basis, I think that, that you know, that can be life-saving. But anybody else uh, have thoughts with the administrators? I'll just have one more thing. I mean, uh, and this is unique to us. I mean, but both of my hybrid rooms are still in the COVID ICU. So, um, you know, that's an issue too. So I wish my administrators did not make my hybrid rooms into ICUs but we had to do what was necessary to deal with the, uh, with the crisis. Any other issues any of you have faced? I think that uh, I can, uh, I, I think we, you know, uh, in, in my sphere, um, uh, the administration has been very supportive. In fact, they asked my opinion um, as the medical director of the cath lab, which cath lab do you want open, which should we shut down? So we were able to, um, th that was good. I think the biggest challenge we faced is uh, with uh, with other disciplines in the hospital, in that you know what seems elective for uh, cardiology may not be elective for general surgery, and uh, making sure that all disciplines are on the same page uh, has been challenging. You know we have to respect each other because we all understand our own field better than than others, yet at the same time um, some of those uh, I think it was challenging to interpret the rules. So it's not by, uh, not a fault of anybody's, it's just the rules are sometimes challenging and the direction can be sometimes challenging to interpret, but just making sure that all the, all specialties who do procedures um, are under the same page when it, uh, under the same umbrella and on the same page where, where, when it comes to resuming cases and what types of cases to resume. That's been the biggest challenge I would say for us. I think it, it may be different uh, for those of us in academic practice. We're certainly still all going to feel some, you know, financial stressors from this because of loss of revenue for our divisions or at our institutions. But I can only imagine that it's, uh, you know, much more so for people in, you know, solo and group practices and private practice, people who own uh, uh, and operate their own outpatient uh, facilities. Uh, Anything specific that any of you have been uh, dealing with from a revenue standpoint? We may not be the best audience to answer some of those questions, but. Well, hey, Gustavo, the Mayo Clinic has uh, furloughed some people, I understand. I mean, I think this uh, highlighted uh, first and foremost, really the importance of the interventionalist and surgical practice to the institution as a driver, a, a driver of patients, of imaging, of consultations. Uh, so I, I, you know, certainly I have not seen through, I've been here for 22 years, nothing even close when we compare to 2008 to now, but I, you know, I think that is a first in the history of Mayo. And the, the financial impact of this has been tremendous. As, as you heard on the news, there has been a lot of people that were furloughed, uh, and a lot of cuts of everything that is non-essential uh, has been, been cut. And there is a, a tremendous anxiety of the staff that remains into what's going on in terms of the future, you know, because, you know, when are we going to start? How fast are we, are we going to start? All the staff is eager to start working again. Uh, I would say if given a chance, we can ramp up really fast. It, it's up really to the government right now to, to decide, but um, significant impact here, Darren, it, really impressive in terms of the everything now is surrounding the, this, this, this issue and uh, all the effort to, to, to save as much as we can and to make it as efficient as we can to recuperate. Good. Um, 
I think that that's an important thing, uh, issue. Uh, and I know that all of our colleagues, whether in academics or in private practice, probably even more so in private practice, are going to be dealing with the fallout uh, financially from this. And it'll be interesting to, to see where that goes. So uh, stay touched. I don't think, I think the jury's out on, on where it's all going to end up, but I think there's going to be a massive uh, impact. Um, we, we do have just a couple minutes here. Why don't we just uh, um, quickly wrap up? Um, I think the most important thing, I mean, what are we going to do or what are some key things that we can do to reassure our patients that it's safe to come back and, and have their cardiovascular uh, issues uh, addressed? Uh, Ellen? You know, I, I really think that Dr. Qureshi's suggestion about the physician reaching out personally as the first contact point, I, I think that's very important. We're the ones that they want to hear from. And if we can reassure them and explain how they are safer coming in and getting their disease taken care of rather than waiting at home, I, I think that, that that is what will convince people. It would be nice if we could demonstrate that staff is being tested. Um, but that's, I think, a, a difficult problem to handle because especially in areas that have had, you know, that have been very affected by the pandemic, if I was a hospital administrator, I'd be wondering what to do with these positive staff members. You know, do you does that mean you send everyone home again? And then how does that affect your rollout as you're trying to ramp back up? So I think that that's a fairly difficult question, but if we can assure patients that other patients are being tested, that you know, COVID positive patients are being quarantined away from where they will be, I think that'll go a long way toward reassurance. Yeah, I think for us, it's a, it's a big deal because a lot of our patients come from outside of Manhattan and New York City. And, you know, if you're from an area that's not as impacted, do you really want to drive into New York and go into one of those hospitals right now? So for us, I mean, it's a big issue. I mean, we're going to have to do uh, marketing, outreach to patients, outreach to referring doctors to convince them that we can demonstrate to them that we have protocols for testing and maintaining patient safety during their treatment and that it is safe to come back and that we're gonna take care of you and we're not gonna uh, let anything uh, 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 inadvertent or bad uh, happen to you. So I think that that's, uh, that that's gonna be really important. Well, I think that uh, we're essentially out of time. There are a number of additional questions that have, uh, have come in. Um, we're capturing all of these questions. So everybody's questions are important. And uh, we're going to find a way to respond. I think that Gore is going to have this uh, webinar up on their website so that people can come back and that we can also uh, perhaps uh, post answers to everybody's uh, uh, questions. Um, I'd like to thank all the guests and everybody who joined us today. Um, it's amazing how uh, this little virus has impacted us uh, uh, so much, and I think it's important that we're all coming together and sharing our experiences and uh, helping each other figure out how to how to deal with this and, and how to help our patients uh, deal with this. I'd like to thank Gore, of course, for sponsoring this, and most of all, uh, I really want to thank um, you, the panelists, um, who gave up your time as well uh, to help out tonight. So again, this is the first in a series of uh, four uh, webinars. Uh, next week, we'll have another webinar. I believe it's on Wednesday, but it will be uh, posted on Gore's uh, website and the email blasts and invitations uh, will go out just like they did uh, this week. So come back next week and uh, thank you all for joining us. And everybody have a good night and stay safe. All right. Thank you.